Good morning. My name is Reagan Harper, and this year I've had the privilege of having Nathan Bell as a senior assistant. And um, joining me on the panel today is Jared Nelson and Mary Henson. And if y'all would please pray with me, and then we will get into Nathan's presentation. Father, we thank you for this morning, for this opportunity to gather as your people and to join in discussion about things that are really, really important. I pray for peace and clarity of mind for Nathan and for the panel. And I also pray that you would guide us in a spirit of generosity and fellowship as we pursue your truth together on this topic and that it would be edifying to all. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Mom, Dad, I have something I need to tell you. I've been wrestling with it for months now, trying to figure out how to tell you this, but I can't hold it in any longer. I'm gay. Did anyone feel the temperature in the room drop? <laughs> for many Christians, a sentence like this can often catch you flat-footed. And if you grew up in church, you're surrounded by people in the LGBT community, even if you don't know it. Roughly 83% of the LGBT community grew up in church. 51% of them left by the time they were 18, and only 3% said that the reason they left was because of the church's teaching on homosexuality. So what does this mean? It means that how we approach this sentence means everything. In a world where sexuality and gender identity issues are more prominent than ever before, the church needs to stand out as a light to others. But how do we minister to our LGBT neighbors? There are six passages in the Bible that explicitly mention the topic of homosexuality. Genesis 19, Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Romans 1, 1 Corinthians 6, and 1 Timothy chapter 1. But the most explicit mention of homosexuality in the Bible comes from the Levitical laws. You shall not lie with a male as with a woman. It is an abomination. Pretty straightforward. But Nathan, it doesn't say anything about loving, consensual same-sex relationships. Surely those aren't bad, right? Well, although it may seem harsh, the Levitical law isn't specific. And therefore, it must be interpreted that it condemns all forms of same-sex relationships, well-intended or not. It doesn't specify the status of the homosexual relationship, simply that this is wrong. And we have to assume that this applies to loving same-sex relationships as well. If we look at the broader context of this Levitical passage, though, we start to notice that the sin of homosexuality is listed with a great amount of other sexual sins. And this is really important. So important, it's actually listed the same way in the New Testament. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul writes that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Romans 1 contains another passage about homosexuality, but if we look at the broader context of Romans chapters 1 through 3, we start to see that Paul has a different message in mind. Everyone is condemned without Jesus. No exceptions. Paul doesn't write this passage to condemn gay people. He writes this passage to condemn all people. That means you and me. This helps us see that homosexuality isn't an isolated sin, simply a sin. One of millions that we all struggle with, and one that we all need the grace of God to help overcome. But we still only understand half the story. Although we know that the Bible doesn't hold homosexuality to be worse than other sins, it's still painted in a non-affirming light. Now that we know where the Bible comes from about homosexuality, we have to understand where the LGBT community comes from. And that means answering the ever-present question, what makes someone gay? Most Christians are divided into two camps about this. You're either born gay or you choose to be gay. Affirming Christians believe that you're born gay, and because God created you and you're gay, then God created you to be gay, and it's perfectly acceptable for you to act that way. Non-affirming Christians believe that you choose to be gay, and because God created you and homosexuality is contrary to the nature of God, you must choose to be gay. But by that same token, it must also stand to reason that at some point, every person decided to either be gay or straight. So ask yourself this question. 
when did you choose to be straight? Did you? Chances are you don't know. Because you didn't choose to be straight any more than someone else chose to be gay or lesbian. And it's important to stop and note here that using the term gay as an identity is different than simply having same-sex attraction. I believe both the gay birth and the gay choice arguments are incorrect. And I'm willing to bet that you develop opposite-sex attraction in the same way that someone else develops same-sex attraction. Sort of. Let me explain using a man for example. Because men are simple creatures. <laughs> a boy's personality is divided on a continuum. On one end, there exists a sensitive personality, and on the other end exists a personality type that I like to call rough and tumble. No man is all the way on one side or all the way on the other, just so we're on the same page. Every man has a little bit of sensitivity and a little bit of roughness. Rough and tumble guys express themselves physically. They might parade through the house when they're happy or kick holes in walls when they're angry. They're typically very mechanical in the sense of, I'm going to take this apart and I might be able to put it back together sort of way. And they love doing things in groups of other guys. Around 97% of the male population would identify as being rough and tumble. The male world is dominated by group sports like football, baseball, basketball, and soccer. This is why. Sensitive guys take in experiences around them and evaluate them on an emotional level. They express themselves creatively. They're typically involved in the arts, such as music, theater, and dance. And they don't typically hang out with groups of other guys, so if they play sports, they typically play sports that are focused on the individual. Sports like tennis, golf, cross-country, swimming. Only about 3% of the male population would identify as being sensitive. Almost universally, however, a man who struggles with same-sex attraction would affiliate with being a sensitive guy. To enable your child to become emotionally confident, four needs have to be met by the father. Affirmation, acceptance, attention, and affection. Dads, this is really important. Affirmation means that you're lifting your son up in a way that he understands, however that may be. It may look like telling your son, you're a man, I love you, or I'm proud of you. You have to get involved in things that he likes. You have to enter his world. Acceptance is the active wing of affirmation, and inviting your son to participate in activities with groups of other guys is a great example. Attention for a rough and tumble guy typically just means proximity. If dad's within eyesight of him, he's happy. Attention for a sensitive guy means you need to have proximity and presence. That means being in eyesight of dad and also making eye contact with him. And finally, there's affection. Affection means giving that boy love in a physical way, such as high fives or hugs. These needs are necessary to be met for both rough and tumble guys and sensitive guys. As a boy grows up, he typically goes through four stages that result in opposite sex attraction. From zero to three, a boy is primarily supposed to be around his mom. From four to 10, boys need to do three things. Disconnect with mom, connect with dad, and connect with at least one other male peer. From 11 to 16, go, boys go through puberty, and typically by 17 years old, a boy's hormones have oriented themselves toward the mysterious otherness of femininity developing into an opposite sex attraction. In the development of same-sex attraction, however, there's a disconnect between one of these fundamental stages, typically concerning a sensitive guy. In same-sex attraction development, the boy grows up in an environment where there's a lack of these four A's met by the father. And this could be from a number of reasons, such as an absent or deceased father, a father always traveling for work, or even an abusive father. But because they don't connect on a fundamental level, eventually they start to pull away from each other. As a sensitive guy, he's likely singled out by other male peers for being different than them. And because of this, he doesn't get those four A's met in a crucial developmental stage of his life. Instead, he disconnects from masculinity almost entirely and begins to affiliate himself with femininity. Now masculinity becomes this mysterious otherness to him. And when he goes through puberty, those hormones collide with the mysterious otherness of masculinity developing into an or a same-sex attraction. Okay, Nathan, that's all well and good, but how in the world does that relate to me? It means that the only difference between you and a same-sex attracted person is that a same-sex attracted person almost universally grew up in an environment where there was a lack of emotional and relational connection from their own gender. As we've already seen by looking at the Bible, we know that homosexuality isn't held to be worse than other sins, so no matter what sex we're attracted to, 
no matter what faces our problems wear, we all need two things. We all need connection, and we all need Christ. When any attraction association keeps happening, your brain is trained like a muscle to think that way. Synapses in your brain wire themselves to associate a physical observation with an emotional attraction. And because it's a hormonal response, same-sex attraction can never really go away. No amount of reparative therapy or prayer can truly wipe same-sex attraction from someone's mind, but there is hope. Romans 12.2 tells us, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. A truth that's applicable to any attraction, any sexual orientation, any temptation, any sin, anyone. And although we can't get rid of those connections over time, we can build stronger connections over time that weaken the hold of same-sex attraction in someone's life. We can't be fixed. What we can be is changed. Changed through the power of Christ. So now we ask the question, how can I help someone in the LGBT community come to this incredible, radical, change-for-the-better mindset? When God led the Israelites out of Egypt, he didn't set a standard. He didn't say, stop sinning first and I'll get you out of here. He didn't say, change the way you think, and then we'll talk about this whole slavery thing. He led them out quickly and without stipulations. He turned to his people in a time when they were broken, alone, and helpless, and said, my child, I love you, and I'm going to get you out of here. We can talk about the details and the rules once you're safe in my arms, but for now, just come to me. Am I talking about gay people? No. I'm talking about you. You see, God doesn't call us to repent before we walk in the doors of the church. Jesus didn't begin a relationship with a tax collector or a prostitute by giving them a political spiel. The salvation of Christ isn't dependent on how we acted before the cross. Jesus didn't begin a relationship with someone by giving them a stance on their sin. He opened it with love. As followers of Christ, we shouldn't just desire for someone to change. We should desire for them to live a holy life. Gay people don't need to pursue being straight. Shocker. Them, like all of us, need to pursue Christ. Preston Sprinkle, author of People to be Loved, Why Homosexuality is Not Just an Issue, said a great quote. Our truth will not be heard until our grace is felt. So do we confront? Yes, and urgently so. But we confront with the otherworldly, transformational love of Christ. I interviewed Jonathan Carper, an associate counselor affiliated with Living Hope Ministries, about this topic, and his take on the subject was this. I don't see a lot of churches doing this well. I see some churches wanting to do it well. I see some openness to that, but I just don't think they have the resources or the knowledge on how to do it well. Many people who struggle with same-sex attraction or gender identity find it hard to talk to Christians about how they feel. When someone confides in you that they're gay, start by thanking them for trusting you and simply listen to their story. Tell them that they're not alone and that you'll walk beside them. If they haven't yet accepted Christ, start by sharing the gospel, the message that God loved them so much that he sent his son to die for them to be saved. That's a great place to start. If they are Christian or after they've come to accept Christ, help remind them that their identity should be in Christ, not their sexuality. Sexuality isn't who we are, it's what we experience. Encourage them to pursue God-honoring same-sex friendships and be that friend if they need it. Be intentional, be transparent, be patient. I need you all to hear what I'm about to say. Stop telling gay jokes. It breaks my heart to see groups of teenage boys pick on someone who identifies as gay or lesbian and treat them like they're something less than human. The words you say mean everything. And to be frank, gay jokes are unhelpful, unchristian, not funny, not intelligent, and a poor use of our God-given intellect. And in the end, it makes it harder to minister to a sensitive demographic who's likely already been hurt by the church. At MCA, we're taught the art of rhetoric our sophomore and junior year. We're taught this in an effort to become better public speakers, student leaders, and mentors to the people around us. And one of the most crucial concepts of rhetoric is having goodwill toward your audience. That means seeking the best interest of the person you're talking with at heart. It's easier said than done, I know. But the best way, perhaps the only way, to truly break down the walls that divide the church and the LGBT community 
is remember that gay people aren't simply an argument to be won, but people with lost souls and broken spirits whom God has called us to help lead to him. As Preston Sprinkle says, instead of love the sinner, hate the sin, why don't we love the sinner, hate our own sin, and invite a fellow sinner to join hands with us so that we can pursue the only one who's not a sinner together. Thank you. Traditional question, what are your plans for next year? <laughs> um, my plans for next year, I'm going to go to Oklahoma Christian University, and I'm going to pursue a degree in psychology, and I will also be on scholarship for their swim team. Go Eagles. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right, well, I have kind of a funny story first, I guess. <laughs> Nathan's paper is 27 pages long. <laughs> yes. And when he brought this magnum opus to me <laughs> and set it down on my desk, I had two thoughts. One was, wow, this is amazing. And the other was, I'm a first year tutor. <laughs> How am I going to grade this? How am I going to do it justice? Start off strong. That's right, that's right. And I must say, though, that your uh, clarity of thought in this and your excellent writing skills made it easy for me, and I really appreciate that. And one other aspect to this is that um, there is research that you've done beyond what you've included in this. Yes, and, ma'am. Um, I was just curious, uh, what in, in your research on this topic, what was it that finally kind of, I don't know, maybe it was a light bulb moment or... Uh, just brought you to an understanding that this developmental path, um, some of what you've presented in your speech, this is what this is what I want to present. This is what's going to be helpful for the church to understand how to interact with the homosexual community. Well, I think one of the, I mean, one of the key things to having a good conversation with someone about really anything, but especially this topic, is having like an understanding of who they are and where they come from and. Mm-hmm. You know, the things behind it. I think my goal in this entire process has been to humanize this instead of demonize this. So really I wanted to try and find research that was reinforcing that idea of, you know, these people are people too. And they're just, they're not that different. So. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that, that clearly came through in everything you said. And of course, everything we've read here as well. Um, you brought up a phrase in your speech, uh, reparative therapy. Yes. Um, and I know just from the years that I've kind of tracked this issue, um, both as a Christian and uh, just cultural, you know, observer, um, that's kind of a, a phrase that was uh, popularized in the 90s and has kind of, you know, been overshadowed by other things recently. Um, can you talk a little bit about maybe the history of what reparative therapy is and then maybe some helpful elements of it, and then maybe some unintentional outcomes maybe that uh, maybe weren't as good, maybe. Yeah. So um, I want to say probably in the 60s maybe was whenever all of this sort of like sexual identity stuff started coming to light. And um, not that it's a new issue, it's just that's whenever it started to surface. Um, at the time people viewed being gay or lesbian as a mental illness. And so they kind of treated it like that. So reparative therapy at the time, um, they would strap someone to a chair and they would put electrodes all over their body and they would do what's, it's called electroshock therapy. And basically anytime they had some sort of same sex desire or whatever, they would shock them. Uh, to try and, I guess, fry it out. I don't. Um, that didn't go over well, obviously. So uh, since then, obviously, it's become illegal to do shock therapy, as far as I know of. There may even still be a couple states that do it, but um, it's not viewed as a mental illness anymore. Um, 
obviously because it's widely accepted and encouraged and stuff. But, um, now it's a lot of kind of, now that, now that we kind of understand where the whole, where it comes from, how it develops, that sort of thing. Um, reparative therapy is more of a talk based therapy and especially in our culture today, um, because it's so widely accepted, most of the time, if you're seeking out therapies who actually help with same sex attraction, it's typically coming from a biblical base. So like Exodus had their thing in the nineties. That was iffy. And then, um, recently, I mean, more recently, there've been other organizations that have, I guess, started since, um, one of them being living hope ministries, which is a organization that specializes in helping people deal with same sex attraction. And anyway. Good. Okay. Yeah. Very, very good. Um, I'm going to quote your paper here and follow up with a couple of thoughts and questions. Uh, remember not to focus on the externals, mannerisms, clothes, posture, etc. The change that matters is not on the outside. Encourage pursuit of God honoring same sex friendships and be that friend if they need it. Be intentional, be transparent, be patient. Yes. Um, I think a lot of the parents in the room uh, may identify with what I'm about to say, <laughs> but um, I know growing up in the church, <clears throat> Sunday night worship was a testimony night. And so often the testimonies that only, that were, that were highlighted, and obviously wonderful, you know, anyone's testimony is valuable to hear, but so often they were only testimonies about instant change. Like, I accepted the Lord, and from that day forward, my life was completely different. <laughs> Praise God for that. That, that, is a, that is a true thing that happens. But I think, and I know at least for me, that um, kind of, it really affected the way that I, per, you know, that I perceive how the Lord works in people's lives as He enters their life, and then He begins to change them. And so... I just thought maybe you might like to talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, change can be instantaneous if that's what God desires, but really it's the little things. Um, it actually makes me think of a C.S. Lewis quote in, I think it was the screw tape letters. He said, the path to hell is slow and gradual. Don't quote me on that. I don't think I quoted that correctly, <laughs> but, um, but I think that the same can be said about salvation as well. Not always, but I think sometimes just like continually spending time with someone who is like trying to lead you to Christ in a sense, like holding your hand while you're walking up this path and then eventually you just get it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think just follow up on that. C.S. Lewis, he kind of has that same journey into faith where um, he became aware just little by little. Like he first was like, okay, I'm not going to be an atheist anymore. I'm a theist. I believe that there is a God. And then just little by little, it was like his awareness of what the Lord was doing in his life grew over time. Yeah. Um, all right. One more. Um, I want to go to a scripture real quick and get your thoughts on it. Uh, Ephesians 5, 2 through 4. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children... And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not be even named among you, as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish nor, uh, talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. So... That one verse alone encapsulates a lot of the big ideas in your uh, paper. Love, yep. sharing the love of Christ, um, and of course, um, joking, foolish talk. Yeah. Um, so, would you like to talk about that a little bit more? I mean, yeah. Um, sure. So, I think um, that, let's see. Um, that passage actually reminds me of a verse in Galatians 6, where um, it's Galatians 6.1. It says, 
Um, Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you may also be tempted. It kind of conveys the same message. Mm -hmm. But the same sort of, kind of like, restore that person gently. That doesn't mean don't confront it, Mm -hmm. but confront it in a healthy, God-honoring way. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, and uh, does coarse joking refer only to gay jokes? No. I, in fact, well, I want to say it refers to like all forms of junior high foolishness, but <laughs> um, not, not only that, but um, I think just like whatever takes your focus away from the things that are really important, especially if it's degrading someone else mm-hmm. like that, that's a big thing. Man, Nathan, I, uh, I've been really excited to talk about this. Okay. Really? Yeah. So, um, I've got, I've got so many things to talk about, so I just, I'm going to jump in. Um, so in your, in your thesis, uh, you talk about there being two camps that people generally fall into where it's like this genetic thing, you know, homosexuality mm-hmm. is a genetic thing that somebody's born with, or it's a choice. And you discuss how, you know, you kind of disagree with both of these ideas. Yes. So I wanted to read a couple verses from James. I wanted to read James 1, 14 through 15. Um, James says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So I think my question with that is, as we're discussing homosexuality as a sin, is it fair to say then that there has to be a choice for something to be a sin? I think that's running off the assumption that um, even just having attractions is a sin. And so I think it becomes a sin when you act on them. Okay. Um, I think having them, it's, well, Jacob brought it up in his thesis last night. It was about temptation. Uh, it's kind of this, like, it's not really good or bad. It's just there. And how we choose to interact with it is what makes it good or bad. And so I think it's the same sort of idea of, like, it, and if you're tempted beyond, I mean, you're not going to be tempted beyond what you can bear. So I think, like, especially whenever you lean into Christ, like, he'll deliver you from that. So. Yeah, so I think you're, you're on to something then. So you're saying that the, the primary distinction then lies in same-sex attraction as in this is, this is almost like maybe a sin bent that I gravitate towards right. versus actually acting on that. Yes. Okay. Um, so would the sin in this case be that I'm making the choice to be gay as opposed to this is something that I struggle with, but you know, I am, I'm not giving into that temptation. Yeah. I think it's a sin whenever you say like, this is who I am. This is what I'm going to do. Um, but like I said, simply having those attractions doesn't make you as well you're a sinner no matter yeah. what, but yeah. it doesn't make yeah. you a, uh, like, anyway. So does this, does this then, or should this reframe how we think about the topic then? Because generally, when we discuss this topic, we strictly refer to, like, whether or not somebody's gay, right? As opposed to, should we actually think of it more in terms of somebody might have same-sex attraction but I shouldn't just jump into this camp of saying, well, they are gay. As if I'm putting this, giving them this identity when it may be they have this sin bent, but it's not something that they have said, this is what I'm about. Yeah, that's a great point. Because I feel like so many times, like even um, if there's people that just like, you know, for instance, I, I heard of this example once of, um, it was actually in the book that I read of a woman that had texted this pastor about him or about her and her daughter who had same sex attraction, if they would be able to go to his church. And basically he was like, yeah, God loves everyone. Um, but does she use it? Does she use it as an identity or 
are you imposing that identity on someone else? Anyway, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, switching gears a little bit to another, another thing you talked about. So I have some, uh, some questions about this masculinity continuum, um, as you discussed it. So is it possible for a man to gravitate heavily towards both ends of the spectrum where they kind of fall into this rough and tumble category, but then they also can fall into this sensitive category. I, well, yes and no. Okay. I think, so I, if I understand your question, you're asking if people are like more of the extremes well, or can somebody fall into like, Towards both extremes. Towards so both think, extremes. Like, here's here's my example. Okay, so asking for a friend. So um, there's there's a guy that he really enjoys the rough and tumble activities, playing group sports, you know, doing a bunch of outdoorsy things. But then the same guy also really enjoys Jane Austen movies and yeah. scented candles and pumpkin spice everything. Yeah. So you okay. know, is, yeah. How would you how would you talk about that? Um. I would actually say that's closer to the middle, actually. But um, and really, I think the only person that's on the end of both continuums would be Jesus. And I would actually argue he's both ends and like perfectly in the middle and kind of like all encompassing what masculinity is. I I don't know if that yeah, answers no. your question. But. No, that's great. All right, awesome. I'll pass it on to Mrs. Henson. Hello. Hello. I have a lot of questions as well, so I'm going to, to jump right in also. Swanky. So, I think, yeah, it is very swanky. Thing. I tip my hat to you. All right, so I think a lot of this discussion, kind of the way that it gets framed, and maybe it's not the right framing, but it kind of gets set up as the traditional Christian community versus the LGBTQ community. Yeah. Um, and kind of at the crux of that, the whole argument ends up centering around the legitimacy of same-sex relationships. Um, and this ends up creating very much from the start, like a us versus them mindset. Um, and then eventually what ends up happening is the only thing we have in common is fighting. Yeah. Um, and so that's like a bad way to start any conversation. And so kind of walking into any sort of conversation, you want to know where do our values overlap um, mm. And then what values are just always going to be different um, because that kind of helps you be able to like steward the conversation in a way that's productive and respects the humanity of the other person. And so um, where do, you know, traditional Christian values overlap with the values of the LGBTQ community, would you say? Um, I don't remember where it is in the Bible, but basically like... There's a big passage about hospitality mm -hmm. and like loving your neighbor and those things. Um, so I think the whole one one thing I think that the LGBT community actually does right is there's always a door open, mm -hmm. there's always a table to sit at, there's always a person to talk to, and there's always someone that loves you no matter what. Mm -hmm. And I, in a weird way, I feel like the church does a lot of those things until it overlaps with the LGBT community. And then they kind of like sit back. They're like, I don't want to deal with this. But I think that's one big overlap. And if they truly overlapped, I think that would be a, like that would really start bringing everyone together. Cause you don't see very many, um, people in the LGBT community at a Baptist potluck, mm -hmm. but, but maybe you should, you know, because, you know, what conversations would that foster and what message does that send? Not, not of we're affirming, but that we, we love everyone. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that makes sense um, for sure. Um, I think that both the church and the LD LGBTQ community do want to speak out against discrimination and violence towards marginalized groups and they want to be treated well and follow the golden rule and I think to some degree get rid of homophobia so yeah. that we can be able to have those conversations and, and openly share the love of Christ with everyone. So where do you think 
those two groups, their values are just always going to intrinsically be different. Hmm. Um, I think at the root of it, of it all, where is their identity? Um, you know, as Christians, our identity should be in Christ. And with the LGBT community, their identities in their sexuality or their gender identity most of the time. Um, it makes you wonder why it's called pride. Like, it's got to be called that for a reason. I think it's because so much of, I mean, it, I don't want to sound mean, but I think the root of it with the LGBT community is like, it's all about me. Like, this is who I am. You have to conform to what I believe. And you can't really question that because then you're not loving me. Which isn't really exactly what Christ calls us to do. It's just sort of like, I love you. This is why I'm calling you out. And so, I think that's where we have different opinions. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that seems to kill the conversation um, is the fact that it's often difficult for us, regardless of um, you know what we struggle with, just to discuss our questions and doubts and our sins in a personal way. Um, kind of like what Mrs. Harper was talking about. A lot of testimonies you hear in church are people who are changed instantly, or um, the testimony is given after the person has kind of like resolved their, their sin struggle. Mm -hmm. And so you're hearing somebody who's kind of on the other side. And very rarely do we hear about the day-to-day -day struggle of people in process in regard to any sort of sin. Um, and even reading the Bible, you know, it can kind of be the same way where it's like, I can read 10 chapters of a book and watch like somebody's whole life unfold. And it's like, right. good for them, but I don't know what to do right now. Yeah. Um, and so how do you think just as the church, we can become more co comfortable with talking about sin in a way that's personal rather than impersonal and kind of exposing that part of the sanctification process. Hmm. I think the, the first thing that came to mind was stop viewing everything as having to be instantaneous, mm -hmm. especially in our culture today. We're like, I want something, I want it now. That's what Amazon Prime is for. <laughs> so, um, but and and how has that trickled into our spiritual walk too, you know? Like, especially this year, I've been like, God, why aren't you speaking to me? Like, I need to hear these things now. And what I've realized is sometimes you just need to shut up and listen for a little bit. And listen for days and weeks. And and maybe you maybe you haven't heard back from him yet, but that doesn't mean he's not working things out. So that's the first thing that jumped to my mind was it doesn't always have to be instant. Okay, and then last question before I pass it back to Mrs. Harper. Um, what do you think that churches and schools can do to kind of thoughtfully begin um, this conversation before people leave for college? Because I think a lot of students um, who do have questions about gender identity and sexuality most of the time when they're living in their parents' household, don't want to start that discussion before they leave for college just because they're afraid of retribution from their parents. And then especially if they attend a school that's religious, don't want to say anything about it for fear of how the authority structure at the school will treat them. And so they wait to come out until they're at college where they're not living under any of those anymore mm. and can kind of, um, kind of test that on their own, or if they're still, you know, in high school or middle school, they just learn about it through a screen, which isn't really a conversation, right? Um, and you're not actually trying to test things or put things into practice. It's just kind of a one-way, um, a one-way, I guess, like method of learning about it. And so, how do you think schools and churches can kind of help thoughtfully begin this conversation um, before people head off to college? Hmm how to begin the conversation. I think, I think, hmm, it makes me think of uh, 1 Corinthians 13, where it starts out with, you know, love is patient, love is kind. And then later down the list, 
love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. That doesn't mean truth doesn't come. It just comes a little bit later than the first. But I think the same sort of, I mean, you need to foster an environment where there is this kind of stipulation of, like, we don't judge people. And we're all sinners. This is this is just a difference in that you struggle with. Um, so I think in churches especially, we get dressed up on Sundays and walk in and we all act like nothing's wrong. But I think the more people are willing to say, I've had a rough week. Like, I, I need God today. And that alone will create this environment where it's okay to be sensitive about what you're struggling with. And then that opens the doors that you were talking about. Awesome. Cool. Thank you. All right. So follow up on a few things that were said here. Um, so uh, you mentioned Exodus, which was kind of the first parachurch ministry that actively pursued engaging this community and also trying to build a bridge between the church and our LGBT neighbors. Um, and part of the weakness of that, some of the fallout that came from that, is that um, the context of it was people with the exact same sin struggle, which we could name many different, this is not to, you know, to support groups or anything like that, but part of the weakness of everybody saying, well, here in our local church, we don't really have any way to address this, but there's this other ministry, mm-hmm. and you can go here and meet, and you can go to these conferences. Well, a lot of, you know, not great things happened as a result of that. Right. Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, y'all mentioned, like, hospitality, obviously. That's a big part of Rosario Butterfield's story as well. Mm. Three years' worth of dinners at a Christian couple's home, getting honest answers to honest questions. Yeah. Um, and... I, there's a, there's a metaphor used in the uh, New Testament specifically for who we are now as a church. And uh, there's two. Adoption into a family. How might that be better used by the church to minister to people who are struggling with this? Mm. I, Seeing I, their place where they fit in, I guess. Yeah. Um, I It's almost like it's using the same lingo to me because with the LGBT community, I mean, they establish themselves like as a community first and foremost, but then they're kind of, it's, it feels like a trauma bond, but they're all like a family because of what they've experienced from other people. Um, but they do have this sort of family mindset. They look out for each other. And I think that would probably be a great way of, rephrasing how the church should address so yeah we're mainly now uh defined by our brotherhood and sisterhood right right um and i think that's a helpful helpful way to think about it um all right so one other thing about your as i said your magnum opus (laughs) is that you also turned it in two weeks early (laughs) and i thought that was awesome uh but i have a question um, have you ever had a deadline that you were not able to meet or early? <laughs> um, I don't think so. <laughs> if there was, if there was a deadline, I was the first person to turn it in. Usually, okay. <laughs> Mr. Nelson could give you a couple <laughs> stories of that, but um, yeah, that's yep. That is not the story of my scholastic journey. <laughs> 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 Um, all right. Uh, I think I'll pass it on so we can. All right. So um, I want to have some follow-up questions to I think the conversation you were having with Mrs. Henson a little bit ago. You had brought up, you know, the the idea of pride um, and how that's such a big part of the LGBT community and kind of how they communicate. Um, and you had mentioned that you know, a lot of it is just about self, Mm -hmm. right? And so like this, this self identity and almost self creating, uh, to some degree. And it made me think about a verse in Psalms 
It's Psalm 100, verse 3. And it says, Know the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Right? You're, you're yeah. quoting along with me. Right? And so, yeah, and so it seems like there's this very real thing where um, it is God that has created us and given us our identities. And we don't get to redefine that for ourselves. Right? We yeah. don't want to. And I think that's that's a large part of our sin nature is, you know, we, we want to redefine this for ourselves, but that's not our place to do it because God has already done that. Yeah. Um, and it made me think about a C.S. Lewis quote, of course. Uh, it's, it's either from mere Christianity or um, uh, the great divorce. And he says there's, there's two kinds of people in the end. There's those people who say to God, thy will be done. And then there's those people who, in the end, God says to them, thy will be done. You know, which is a much scarier place to be in. Yes. Uh, and so, kind of following along with this, how does society's overt celebration of homosexuality complicate Christians' approach to it? I think because it's so widely accepted, um, Christians are kind of in the, the marginalized, like, for, for not accepting this thing. And I think the label behind it on probably both sides is that um, they're just not loving enough. And that's not true. Or it doesn't have to be true, I should say. Because I, I do think that there's a lot of Christians that kind of, especially um, older traditional Christians that will be kind of like very afraid to extend their arm and actually like approach this topic at all. Um, but I feel like most people want to show love. They just don't know how. Yeah. And I think, I think love is an integral part of it. But one of the other words you brought up before was affirming. Mm -hmm. And so how do you, effectively communicate the distinction between loving somebody but not affirming them. I am so glad you brought that up. <laughs> so I, I was actually going to use 1 Corinthians 13 again as my example. Um, if you start with love is patient, love is kind, and then you stop there, it's no longer love because there's no result at the end. Um, I think whenever you stop it, patient and kind, it's it, that's when it is affirmation. But whenever there's that resolution at the end of like, does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth, like that's where it becomes love. Sometimes tough love, but still love. Okay, awesome. Um, well, I have a lot of other questions I would like to ask, and maybe I'll, I'll have follow-up conversation with you sometime later this week. Cool. But uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass it on to Mrs. Henson. That way she can get in a couple more. All right. I think I've got one final question for you um, before we're out of time. So for um, same-sex for same sex attraction that does develop as a result um, of just a dysfunctional relationship with a parent, basically, or something, one of the four A's lacking in a relationship with a parent. Um, it seems like maybe like strengthening that feedback loop between the parent and child could be something that could help prevent that dysfunction um, from being created at puberty. And so do you think there is a way for a child to be taught to communicate like the need like of the four A's more effectively? Because I think sometimes kids even if they're not receiving that attention or you know affection or affirmation from their parents, a lot of times the kid will think, well, I don't want to bother them or put an extra demand on my parent. Mm. My parent is trying the best you know that they can, or you know maybe they just don't know how to offer that. And so, do you think that you know small children can be taught to communicate what they need to their parent a little more tactfully? so that you can kind of close that feedback loop a little more so a kid doesn't grow up and get to puberty um, and then end up with that sexual yeah. dysfunction. I'm not quite sure. I feel like I feel like it's hard for a small child to c communicate not wanting to 
share, let alone like, Dad, I need more affirmation in my life. But, um, <laughs> um, so I'm not sure. I think a lot of it may come from just kind of like practical, like intentionality on the part of the parents. Mm -hmm. And maybe, I don't know. It, and I would also, because I'm not a parent, but I would assume it varies from child to child. So just like noticing like their behavior or maybe like if they're more isolated, just kind of like, hey, are you okay? Like what's going on? And so I'm not quite sure how to answer that. Well, I think what you said, I think what you said was really good. I think it is a very difficult it is a very difficult question and thing to, to think about how, yeah, just what is necessary in communication and not just like in that situation, but in all relationships, mm -hmm. like communication is so difficult and there's a lot of problems that just can be resolved by learning to communicate, like to understand like personally what your own needs are and be able to communicate that to someone else. And I think especially with children, it's just, um, it's something interesting to think about. So I was curious to know your thoughts on that. All right, um, I think it is your chance. Is it that time? The question is that. Um, yes. Okay, well, before I actually ask the question, I just want to let other people in the audience know, like, I'll be here all next week. And uh, <laughs> if you want to talk more about this, I have, I, I would love to talk with you about this. So, um, that being said, my question is for all three of you and actually for the audience as well, just to sort of think about, let's assume I am a junior high kid, seventh, eighth grade, who struggles with same sex attraction. What do you say? In what context does this come up? Um, they come up to you after class and they're like, I guess they, I don't know, they probably would have developed a good repertoire with you and so they, they trust you. They go, hey, Mr. Nelson, I think I like boys. So what would you, what would you say? I think for me, one of the, where I would like to start with it is I would like to ask the student, hey, is this something that you've talked about with the parents? Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, as much as we can, bringing parents into the loop and into the conversation is a crucial part. And I think, you know, for that student saying, hey, you know, I appreciate that you trust me enough to, to share this with me. Um, and I'm happy to talk about it with you, but I think, I think it would be really good if maybe this is a conversation that we could sit down and, you know, clue your parents in on and let's have a conversation. I'm willing to be a part of it, but between me, you and your parents, just so that way we can all, you know, just discuss this. Yeah. So I think that's the way I would, I would answer that. Cool. I would agree with Mr. Nelson and, um, just to add. You're not alone. Um, you're not weird. We all struggle with sin, and we're here for you. And let's have this conversation for as long as it takes. I think my response would be pretty similar um, as well to both of theirs. Um, being open to being present with them um, through any questions they have or um, any sort of like study or research they would like to do in regard to that. Um, I had a teacher in high school um, who, when I came to him with questions, I had like a notebook of questions um, that I had about my faith. Um, and a lot of people who I had asked those questions to up until that point had just tried to talk me into some sort of 
answer, so I would make a decision right then and there. Um, and he was very interesting and impactful for me because he was one of the first people I talked to that didn't give me answers or try to force me to believe the same way that he did. Um, but he gave me books and was willing to have conversations with me. Um, and my faith grew so much more through that approach and through somebody being willing to be long-suffering with me than somebody reacting out of fear or trying to put a whole bunch of rules on me or trying to force me to believe the same thing that they did. Um, and so I think that I would hope I could take a similar approach with a student mm. um, who approached me um, about that. And um, I do have immediate family members and extended family members who are in the LGBTQ community. Um, and so I would like to um, be long suffering with that student the same way I would be with a family member. Mm. All right, Nathan. Well, uh, we, we really appreciated everything that you prepared for us today. And, you know, I'd like to be the first to say well done. Thank you. And so I'm going to close us in prayer and then we'll celebrate. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for Nathan. I thank you for the love that you've put on his heart for the LGBT community, but not just their community, the love that you've put on his heart for just for people and for wanting to just share your love with people and, and help other people see your love and your truth in his life. And I just thank you for the preparation he put into his thesis and I thank you for helping him during the presentation of his thesis. And I just pray that you will continue to be with him and work through his life both here in his remaining time at MCA and then as he goes on to the next stage of his life. Christ's name I pray and ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen.